Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the University of Mary Washington's COVID-19 in Context. My name is Anand Rao, Professor of Communication here at UMW, and I'm very happy to welcome you to the class today, the largest class that UMW has ever offered. You're joined by more than 240 of our incoming students, 600 of our continuing students, 130 of our faculty and staff, over 450 UMW alums, and we're really happy to welcome over 500 of our community members. It means so much to us to have you here, and we appreciate your participation and support. And we had an excellent session on Monday on the biology of COVID-19, and you can find a recording of that session with closed captioning on our course website, umw.edu slash COVID course. And we'll put that link in the chat box. Now, before we begin, a bit of housekeeping. Now, there are two boxes at the bottom of your Zoom screen that will be of use to you. The first is the chat box. This should be used to communicate with me or my colleague, Dr. Keith Mellinger. You'll be introduced to him in about 30 minutes when he moderates the Q&A. You can use the chat box to let us know about any technical problems or concerns, but please refrain from overloading the chat box with general messages or comments. We want to be able to keep track of any comments in the chat box. Now, the second is the Q&A box. And this is where you should enter questions that we can ask the, que the presenters during the Q&A. Now, in addition to be able to ask your question, add your question to this, you can also upvote questions in the box by clicking on the thumbs up icon. It looks just like the one you've seen on social media. You click on the thumbs up icon and then it will go up with the number of votes so that um, as we're able to look at the questions in the Q&A, we'll be able to uh, ask the questions that have the most upvotes. Now, please be sure to look at what other questions are posted and vote for them before entering your own questions so that we don't have a lot of duplicate questions. Remember, the more upvotes, the more likely that question will be asked of our presenters. Now, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Dr. Margaret Ray. She's Professor of Economics and Chair of our Department of Economics at UMW. She'll be joined in the Q&A by her colleague, Dr. Brad Hansen, who's a Professor of Economics. But for now, let me turn it over to Dr. Ray for her presentation on public policy and the pandemic, lives versus livelihoods. Dr. Ray. Thank you, Professor Rao. Um, I wanna welcome everybody and say that I'm just really happy to be here with everyone this afternoon. I'm very excited about this course uh, because it highlights the liberal arts approach to education that we value here at Mary Washington. So I'm really glad to be presenting the economic perspective to that. Um, to considering COVID-19, as well as to point out the interdisciplinary nature of, of economics along the way. So what I want to do in this presentation is introduce the cost-benefit analysis for decision-making, then apply it to COVID-19 choices, and then present the results and public policy recommendations from recent economic research. So just showing that you will have all this on the slides, and I apologize for the, uh, the false start. So cost-benefit analysis, in theory, what we want to do is measure all the benefits, measure all the costs, compare the costs and benefits, and then if the benefits exceed the cost, we want to do that, and if the costs exceed the benefits, we don't want to do it. So the example, should I consume a pint of Ben and Jerry's ice cream? I'll identify the benefits, my utility or my satisfaction, and the health benefits and then identify the costs. So for example, $4.59 a pint. Uh, the transportation and storage costs. So uh, these days I have the uh, grocery delivery service since I'm um, staying at home a lot and the cost of storing the ice cream. And finally, the health costs, um, perhaps excessive calories or excessive sugar, um, uh, health, health costs that I suffer if I eat too much ice cream. So the idea is to determine the total value of the benefits and the total value of the costs, which is really quite difficult when you try to put um, a dollar measure on health benefits and health costs and satisfaction. Um, but economists have a lot of techniques that they use to, um, to try and, and value these costs and benefits. And if the benefits outweigh the cost, I consume the ice cream. So that's how basic cost benefit analysis works. But a lot of times for economists, the question isn't yes or no, it isn't, um, should you or shouldn't you? The question is a matter of how much. So economists use what's called marginal analysis and marginal analysis answers the question, how much? So not should I eat a pint of ice cream or not, but how much ice cream should I consume? So to do that, uh, we look at what are called marginal benefits and marginal costs. 
And since marginal analysis is so important to economics, this is a place where I recommend our students who are going to be taking the quiz at the end pay careful attention and maybe write some notes down here. Um, so marginal benefit refers to the additional benefit from consuming an additional pint of ice cream. So as I consume a second, a third, a fourth pint of ice cream, how do, do my benefits increase? So what is the additional benefit of an additional pint of ice cream? And we know that as you consume more and more of something, the additional benefit will decline. So the first pint of ice cream is going to have really high benefits and the second probably pretty high too, but as I continue to consume more and more ice cream, the additional benefit falls. So you can see the downward sloping negatively sloped uh, marginal benefit curve as you go from left to right. Marginal costs refer to the additional cost of consuming an additional pint of ice cream. So as I consume more and more ice cream, the additional cost goes up. Um, economists know that as you do anything more and more, study, work, eat ice cream, it gets harder and harder to continue doing that. So the marginal cost of additional pints of ice cream increases, we would show the marginal cost line as increasing, a positive slope from left to right. So I can put both of these lines on the same graph. And this is actually the underpinnings of the uh, famous, or you might say infamous, supply and demand graph. And I promise this is the only graph I'm going to do for this presentation. Um, but you can see that at lower quantities, the marginal benefit up here exceeds the marginal cost down here. So I'm getting more benefit from that additional pint of ice cream. It exceeds the additional cost. So I should continue to consume because that adds to my total benefit. And that's going to be true all the way up to here where the two lines intersect. If I were to continue to consume ice cream past that point, you would get to a point where marginal cost exceeds marginal benefit and it wouldn't be worthwhile. I would be less happy after eating that um, pint of ice cream. So as we can see here for me, the optimal amount, the how much, is going to be seven pints of uh, ben and Jerry's ice cream each week. Now, unfortunately, there is a limit on the delivery service, a li limit of four, so uh, I'm not able to consume my optimal amount, but that's a, another economic analysis, I think, for another time. Um, but we continue to um, make the choice to do something until the marginal cost equals the marginal benefit. And that's the basic framework of cost-benefit analysis that we use in economics. So let's try and take that framework and see how we can understand um, COVID-9 mitigation using that, that framework. So mitigation is the act of reducing the severity, seriousness, or painfulness of something. You know, doing things to make it better. So when we talk about COVID-19 mitigation, we're talking about things like uh, hand washing. We talked uh, in the class on Monday uh, about how hand washing can kill the, the virus. Um, social distancing, staying away from people, uh, disinfecting surfaces, face covering, wearing masks, um, staying at home or having, having lockdowns of the economy. And we're going to learn more about uh, surface disinfecting and, and virus mitigation when we have our chemistry faculty presentation um, later in the course. So there's lots of ways to, to mitigate the effects of COVID-19. And so we want to see how to determine the optimal amount of mitigation and therefore the appropriate policy for addressing the COVID-19 pandemic. So if we look at this um, spectrum that goes from taking no action, uh, if we did nothing, nothing in addition to what we normally do before the pandemic hit, um, and the virus runs through uh, society and we have a lot, a lot of deaths, more than we um, had with mitigation. If we took no action, uh, economists estimate that a $6 trillion loss of life would result. Um, that's on one end. On the other end of the spectrum, we have a complete shutdown, right, where there's no interaction, no ability to transmit the disease. Um, and economists estimate that if we did that for a year, the cost would be approximately $7 trillion. Um, we really can't be at either end of the spectrum. It really doesn't make any sense to think that we would take no action. We'd never wash our hands or never wear masks. But it also doesn't make sense to have a complete shutdown because we have to live, we have to eat, we have to go on. Um, but the idea of doing the least possible and the most possible ranges from $6 trillion to $7 trillion. 
So the things that we're talking about doing when we move from no action to some action are things that would have a very low marginal cost and a high marginal benefit, like hand washing, right? It doesn't take much energy, much effort. There's not a high cost to washing our hands, but it comes with a high benefit uh, because it does kill the virus um, pretty well and pretty easily. When we think about a complete shutdown, when we've shut down the whole economy, we're having no interactions with other people, um, those efforts are gonna have a low marginal benefit, but a very high marginal cost because it's really affecting our lives um, and we're not being able to live our lives um, the, that, the way that brings us enjoyment. Um, the benefit's very low because uh, the people that are isolated in a complete shutdown include the people who are well, who aren't infected, right? So we're shutting down and affecting everyone. The optimal amount of mitigation is gonna be somewhere in the middle. If we continue mitigation efforts from no action and increase and increase, eventually we reach a point where marginal benefit equals marginal cost, somewhere there in the middle. And we know that the cost to society is gonna be a lot less than either six or $7 trillion if we take some action. So the idea is to find out what's the appropriate a level, the appropriate amount on that range of mitigation um, that we should try to achieve for society. So let's take an example of social distancing, an individual that's gonna make the choice to social distance or to not social distance. So that individual is going to weigh the costs and benefits of social distancing and decide how much they wanna pursue. So remember the marginal benefits, the additional benefit from additional social distancing is going to decrease the more and more we do. We're gonna do the things first that give us the most added benefit the easiest things that um, prevent infection of the virus the most. Marginal cost, the additional cost of social distancing is gonna go up the more and more we try to social distance because we're gonna be doing harder and harder things to, to social distance and they're gonna have less and less effect on, on uh, preventing the virus infection. So what is the marginal benefit of social distancing? Well, the largest, the big, social benefit, of marginal benefit, is reducing your risk of infection with COVID-19, right? So if you stay away um, and so you don't come in contact with the virus, you're reducing your risk. So you're reducing your healthcare costs, you're re reducing the illness you experience, and you're reducing your chance of death. So that's a pretty big benefit um, from social distancing efforts. Uh, you're gonna get potentially increased utility, increased enjoyment. If you like to be socially distant, if you've been social distancing at home with your family and you enjoy having that family time, um, if you like more time alone, you like working remotely, um, those can be benefits of social distancing for you. Um, and there can be positive psychological effects. So again, if you enjoy social distancing, it reduces your stress, um, you're able to um, use mindfulness and eat better and feel better, you can have positive psychological effects. The costs of social distancing include, the biggest one, lost income and employment, right? So as a result of social distancing efforts, a lot of people um, had their hours cut or lost their job, lost their employment, and that's a huge cost. Also lost education, right? We had to pivot from face-to-face -face classes to online classes at universities in the spring. Uh, K-12 education went remote. Um, and that really affected the level of education. And I think we're gonna have a class later um, in the course on the effect of the pandemic on K-12 education. You might get decreased utility. Uh, if you enjoy being around people and social distancing causes you to give up activities that you like, um, that's gonna decrease your utility. And finally, negative psychological effects. Um, we know that anxiety and depression and, and a lot of negative effects come about when we social distance. And we're gonna have a class from our psychology faculty on positive and negative psychological effects of the pandemic. So if we can identify these different benefits and costs for each individual, uh, they can use cost benefit analysis to determine for them the optimal level of social distancing. Um, but we know that everyone doesn't come up with the same decision with regard to social distancing. Um, we know that they have different information. 
So one of the things that affects different choices to um, go out in public or to wear a mask or to wash your hands or to, to take any of these actions has to do with the information that you have about costs and benefits. And a new virus, we learned a lot on Monday um, about what we don't know, what we're learning, and how difficult and how much time it takes to do good science to learn this information that we need. Um, but we do know that information will go up over time, we're learning more and more, and that testing helps us to increase our information about the costs and benefits. Uh, so the information that we have can be affected by our level of education, our understanding of the information that does exist. And I think our next class is gonna be on communication and, and understanding the terms and the meaning and, and the information that we have regarding costs and benefits from COVID-19. Uh, we have a problem with misinformation. Uh, the reading from last week's class talked about um, a lot of the misinformation that's, that's circulating um, and how we have to work hard to verify the scientific information to prevent misinformation. Disinformation can be a big problem. Um, that's when people intentionally misinform um, about the costs and benefits of COVID-19 for some purpose of their own. And perhaps when we have the class on politics and elections, that, that might come up there. And finally, uncertainty. There's gonna be certain things that we don't know, um, that we can't know. And doing our cost benefit analysis and figuring out how much to social distance is particularly difficult because of all of that uncertainty. So one of the reasons that people make different choices about social distancing has to do with the information that's available. Another reason that people make different choices regarding costs and benefits um, is that different individuals face different costs and different benefits uh, depending on their situation. So the costs and benefits from social distancing vary from person to person. And this inequality in benefits and costs is one of the things that you'll be hearing about in a later class um, dealing with inequality and inequity and the fact that people are affected differently uh, by COVID-19. So for example, demographic characteristics like age, race, and gender, uh, we know that people are affected differently. And the things that we thought we, know, we knew, we found out weren't exactly right. Uh, initially, oh, well, young people aren't, aren't affected, but then we found out, yes, they were. Um, we see differences in the effects um, on men and women. And we see really huge differences in how uh, people of different races are affected by the disease. Um, so your costs and benefits from social distancing are gonna vary depending on your situation and how susceptible you are to infection um, and a lot of other different factors. Health status is going to affect the cost and benefits of social distancing. People with pre-existing conditions, um, people who are likely to um, have a more severe disease if they become infected, the benefits of social distancing are much higher for those people than for other people. So health status, uh, your occupation. Uh, people with different occupations face different susceptibility um, to the disease, therefore the benefit of social distancing is different. Um, in the reading that you had for the class today, the, the author talked about a long haul truck driver who sits alone in their truck driving most of the time versus a clerk at a, an urban grocery store. Right there, costs and benefits are gonna be very different because of their exposure to um, potential exposure to the virus. Income level has a huge effect on the costs and benefits of social distancing. Your income level determines your ability to work from home. It determines your ability to access health care. Um, so income allows you to make much different social distancing choices um, based on whether you have that, the access to that income or not. And finally, geography both location, for example, rural versus urban and the population density, um, or cultures. You know, some cultures wearing a mask is pretty ingrained, others it's not. Some cultures people live um, together in the same household, others they're more likely to live alone. So we have classes coming up uh, later in the course talking about geography of location and, and about different cultures and how that affects uh, the pandemic and social distancing. So we know that people are going to come to different decisions on their own because they have 
different information, and different costs and benefits. So I'd like you to think about how you make your decision regarding social distancing, whether you're going to wear a mask, wash your hands, um, you know, what, what actions you're gonna take, but also think about why someone else may have a different view of social distancing than you do. Try to think about and understand why different people are gonna have different results from their own cost benefit analysis. So individuals are, are trying to make a decision about how much to social distance and look at their own costs and benefits. And economists try to look at and understand those decisions. So Bethune and Korinic um, from the National Bureau of Economic Research estimated that the average cost um, of an additional COVID-19 infection for an average individual is about $80,000. Um, so they did the estimate and the, the cost of an additional infection to an individual, they estimated to be $80,000. But the actual cost of a COVID-19 infection, they found, was approximately $286,000, a lot more than $80,000. And actually, if you have no testing in society, the cost is more like $576,000. Um, so why the difference? What's the difference between the individual cost of an infection at 80,000 and the actual cost to society of 286,000 or even higher if we don't have testing? Well, the difference lies in what economists call external costs. And this is a really important page for those of you that get to take a quiz at the end of the, uh, the presentation today. Economists talk about negative externalities. And negative externalities exist when there's an external cost associated with an activity. So for example, if I decide to smoke a cigarette next to you and the secondhand smoke affects you, well, the cost of my decision to smoke a cigarette has put a cost on you. That's an externality, a cost of someone's choice that falls on someone else. Social distancing is a really good example of a negative externality or preventing one. Because if I go out and I decide not to wear a mask, and as a result, I infect you, the cost of my decision not to wear a mask falls on you. That's an external cost. And while I might choose to, to consider that in my decision, individuals don't have to. They're looking at their own private costs and benefits. So economists see two really important externalities associated with COVID-19 or with any pandemic. Um, the first is called an infection externality. When an individual's actions result in someone else's infection with a disease. So when I choose not to social distance um, and as a result, you become infected. So I don't cough into my elbow, I don't wash my hands, I don't wear a mask, um, I don't stay home. So those are infection externalities and individuals don't consider those costs. The second kind of externality is called a healthcare congestion externality. And that's the idea that during a pandemic, if a lot of people become infected and they all go in in a short period of time to the healthcare system so that the facilities are not adequate to effectively deal with all that illness at one time, that means that people who have other illnesses, strokes, heart attacks, a need elective surgery, that healthcare can't take place. So the cost of having these facilities filled up with um, patients from the pandemic, the cost is that other people don't get adequate health care. So these are the costs that aren't considered in that $80,000, but are considered in those higher values. So because of those external costs, when you have these negative externalities, individual choices don't give us the op optimal outcome. We can't leave decisions up to individuals or we get the $6 trillion loss that was on our range of losses. Right? Public policy is necessary to achieve the efficient level of disease mitigation. We need to have a government step in and set a policy. Um, the benefit of social distancing is much higher than individuals perceive because they're not considering the infection externality um, and the healthcare externalities that exist. So, Externalities are the reason that public policy is needed um, to address the uh, pandemic. So let's take a look real quickly at the policy recommendations from economic research. And the way economists look at the, the pandemic is to take the, um, 
the epidemiological models, the models of the public health officials and the biologists, and layer on top of that the costs and benefits. So you're going to get a, uh, a class later on math modeling, looking at some of those models and how they work. Well, economists work with scientists to um, layer costs and benefits on top of those, um, in this case, disease models, um, to find the optimal policies to address them. So the first uh, policy conclusion that we get from all of the recent pandemic research is that large externalities from COVID-19 lead to inadequate social distancing behavior. People will not uh, pursue social distancing uh, at an efficient level. We'll be further toward that $6 trillion loss, right, rather than more social distancing in that center optimal range where costs would be lower. Second, policies that reduce the cost of social distancing. If we can lower the cost, we can get people to do more social distancing. So for example, if someone feels they, they're feeling sick and they can't stay home from work because they can't afford to give up that income, right, and going to work would lead to more infections, well, a policy that provides them with sick leave, right, will encourage more social distancing behavior. Providing health care coverage, unemployment insurance, these are all policies reducing the cost of social distancing so that we can get more social distancing um, and prevent the number of deaths that we would have had. Regulations that require social distancing, rules, laws, even social norms, increase the benefits of social distancing. Right? If it's expected that I social, socially distance myself and I don't, and there's some penalty, I break a law, I break a rule, I get you know, negative feedback from, from society, then I'm gonna be more likely to pursue social distancing. So having the rules and the requirements um, and social norms that promote social distancing can help. Uh, testing and, and having lots of testing and reliable testing uh, increases the information that we have and therefore decreases the cost of mitigation. Uh, it can help us to prevent the number of infections, prevent the healthcare congestion externality um, and therefore, testing is uh, definitely one of the policies recommended by economists. Um, Paul Romer, who's a Nobel laureate in economics, um, estimated that for every dollar spent on testing, there's $100 savings in costs from um, these externalities. So we save $100 for every dollar spent on testing. That makes it uh, a pretty efficient thing to do. We haven't really talked about the macro economy, um, but taking these measures to socially distance and to decrease the number of infections um, is ultimately going to result in a milder decline in the economy. Um, if we let the uh, virus run rampant through society without any mitigation, uh, we're going to have a much steeper and deeper economic downturn. And the models show that taking these mitigation steps and having these policies results in uh, less disruption in the economy. And finally, here in extra big font and boldface, for those of you that, that are going to be quizzed later, um, the optimal policy that economists see um, in a situation where infection rates are low, right? We have a fairly low infection rate in the United States. Um, so the idea of locking down the whole economy doesn't make any sense. There's so few infections. Um, but we don't want to leave the infections to, to spread and increase. So STTQ, screen, test, trace, and quarantine, right, where we identify people who might be infected, test them to see if they are. When we find infections, trace the contacts and then isolate people so that they can't continue to spread the disease. That's the most efficient and cost-effective public policy um, to deal with the pandemic. And that's the sort of policy that um, our, state, our state policymakers and our university policymakers are looking at these costs and benefits and ways to, to mitigate um, and, and deal with the pandemic in the most efficient way possible. So I have on, on the last slide, the sources that I used in case you wanna look more closely as well as a few extra sources um, if you're interested. And with that, I'll uh, turn it over to Dean Mellinger for our question and answer. Hey, Dr. Ray, thank you so much. That was, that was really terrific. I, um, 
I actually felt like I learned a lot more about economics in general than I ever have before, to be honest. Uh, but contextualizing it with the with the current crisis is uh, is really really helpful. Um, so thank you very much. Um, sorry about the technical issues. I think that's partially our fault too. Uh, I want to start before we uh, get into the Q and A, and there are a, a number of uh, good questions that have come in. They've just been flooding in during your talk, which is a uh, a sign of a very engaging talk. Um, but before we get there, I want to take a second to introduce uh, one of our fac uh, other faculty who are joining uh, Dr. Ray for the Q&A, and that is uh, Dr. Brad Hansen, um, who's, uh, I, I see him, he's here as well, and he will join us for some of the, some of the Q&A. Um, before we get to that, um, quickly, I want to uh, thank you again for the wonderful presentation and uh, the excellent preview of what is coming in the rest of the course. She made many references to the other talks that are coming and there's lots of good stuff ahead. So uh, thanks for that. Uh, also to the UMW students, uh, don't forget that there is a quiz and Dr. Ray made mention of that several times. The quiz will open after the uh, class meeting today and will be available to you through the weekend. So you have several days to review uh, the videos again before you take the quiz. Um, I want to start with a question that actually Dr. Hansen already answered uh, in the chat, but I think it's a good one and it got an awful lot of upvotes and I think it's a, a something that's worth uh, talking about live. So let, let me pose the question here and I'll, I'll let you all uh, take, take a stab at it. Could COVID-19 potentially lead us into another Great Depression? And the, the answer that I gave in, in writing is that um, in some ways, it's likely to be closer to the Great Depression than anything we've had since the 1930s. Um, 1930s, uh, at the low point, unemployment reached 25%. Um, and it's possible that it's going to, very likely it's going to go double digit. Um, you know, with, with COVID, um, could possibly get, get that high. Um, I think in ways that it's unlikely to be the same is that the the downturn in the Great Depression is very long. That is, the economy was getting smaller from 1929 until the spring of 1933, um, which is very, very unusual in terms of recessions in the United States. Um, it seems unlikely that the economy is going to keep getting smaller um, for that long a period of time. Um, you know, and so we've had a, a huge initial shock um, in terms of um, uh, shutdown of the economy, um, except for essential uh, activities, um, raising unemployment. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so there is that huge shock. And as we, as we come out of it, um, and especially hopefully as um, uh, innovation, medical innovations occur, um, you know, so that people are looking for improvements in treatment, people are looking for um, vaccination. After that, um, you know, the economy can recover relatively quickly. Um, you know, I think, and, and so, um, really, it was a sort of combination of bad policy for a very long time that took the depression down as long as it did. Um, on the other hand, I mean, there's a good chance that that recovery could be relatively slow. That is, getting back on trend you know, which, uh, you know, where we had been before with really low unemployment. Um, getting back there could be, could be quite difficult. Um, you know, it's possible that, as I mentioned before, that, that um, sectors, especially like tourism and travel, it could be negatively affected for quite some time. It could take a while. Someone had asked about, you know, could this have a permanent effect on people's sort of uh, tastes and preferences for consumption. And it's certainly, it's certainly possible um, that people will be very reluctant to get back to doing, <laughs> very reluctant to, for instance, get on a cruise ship um, uh, again, you know, and in part because it's, um, you know, it's not just the COVID-19, but it's uh, raised people's attentions of the possibility for pandemic that exist in a world that's con as connected as ours is now. So, um, you know, so I, I would say it's probably not going to be like the Great Depression. One of the things is we've, we've learned a lot about how to react to uh, uh, a recession. 
that we didn't know in the in the 1930s. Um, and so you saw you, you, the huge financial crisis um, and the, the, the uh, uh, downturn in the economy that came with that, but it didn't turn into anything like the Great Depression. Um, and, and so, um, again, I don't think it's going to be that bad, but it's, it, it's a very bad recession. It's, the wor it's probably going to be, in terms of the depth of the downturn, the worst that we've had since the Great Depression. It's certainly the worst in most of our lifetimes. All right, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Rao? Sure, I have the pleasure of asking the next question. This is something that was uh, asked fairly early in the presentation, so you did speak to it, but a number of upvotes, I think, indicate that there, there's a request for a little more information, and that is the idea of freezing the economy. It's something that, that was so new to many of us, and the idea of what does that really mean? Did it really help the situation? Um, did it harm the situation? Kind of looking back on it, was it the right call? And was there maybe another way of handling the economy in, in terms of freezing it versus maybe having some other external controls? Um, yeah, I mean, so I, I, I take what you mean by freezing the economy as being the, the shutdowns um, that, that took place uh, on a sort of rolling basis, because it was done, um, you know, done largely by states um, and cities, um, though eventually it essentially reached the national stage, um, and, and so that 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 shutdown. I mean, really, the the objective of it was. Sorry, just a second. Um, um, you know, the objective was, uh, it was the social distancing. Um, you know, it was to, to reduce the, the rate of transformation. Um, and, um, you know, as, as, as Margaret was pointing out in the talk, the, you know, the effect of that was to, um, in, in several ways, uh, at least according to the uh, epidemiological models, reduce the, the deaths that were likely to occur. Um, and, uh, um, it, you know, and, and consequently, also, you buy time, um, you know, so that uh, the medical facilities would have a chance to uh, 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 react, um, they'd have sufficient resources um, that we could at least potentially build up our testing ability, um, which I, I think, as Mario was pointing out, was, is, is, um, in many economists' estimation, probably the more cost-effective way, if you have the testing ability, um, is to do some sort of um, uh, testing, tracing, and quarantining of, of people so that it's more, it's more concentrated rather than simply preventing everyone from interacting with each other. Um, but it, so I think that, the, uh, again, the idea is that Doing that, at least based upon, again, prominent epidemiological models, and then um, combining that with uh, the economist's um, uh, value of statistical life, uh, suggest you know, very, very large benefits to those, those lives that were, that were saved um, as, a, uh, as a result of doing that. Thanks very much. Um, so jumping back to uh, Dr. Ray, are you uh, able to speculate at all um, on the recovery? The, the question that was asked was, how long would you, would you expect it to take for the economy to get back to normal after changing so drastically, so, so quickly? Yeah, I, I, I think a lot of people wish that they, that they knew that. Um, the, the inf it has a lot to do with, with what do we see going forward? Is there going to be a second wave? Um, you know, are we going to have um, infections increase and then have to in have more of a lockdown? Um, pretty respected study that, that I saw estimated that getting back to the levels where we were um, prior to the pandemic back in January and February um, is, is probably going to take a number of years. Um, but we'll have uh, a, do a good part of that recovery fairly quickly, um, you know, the first year or two. But to actually get back to where we were is, is, is going to take a number of years, and it could be even worse depending on 
whether we see a second wave, whether we, um, you know, where we go from here. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And I think a lot of us are wondering how it's going to affect higher education. Isn't that right, Dr. Rao? <laughs> Absolutely. Just one of many economies there that we're, we're concerned about. Um, you know, getting back to uh, the answer that Professor Hansen had uh, on the previous question, there's another question here talking about the price uh, that's estimated on the human life and talking about the ethics of it. Um, you referenced at the end of, of the, your answer to the last question, Dr. Hansen, about the statistical representation of a value of a life and then the value then, the, the cumulative value that's saved with saving lives. Um, this question looks at a slightly different angle. Um, how ethical is it to put a price on a human life? Um, even if the cost is extremely high per person, it could be used either way, both in terms of the way that you were talking about the cumulative benefits of freezing the economy, slowing the economy, be able to save lives, and then you have an economic uh, analysis of the value of those lives, cumulative, or also, maybe it's being too low and how that factors into decisions. Um, how, do, how do ethics factor in for an economic analysis? <laughs> um, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and, and, and first, um, let me try and clarify a little bit about what that measure is, um, uh, value of statistical life. Um, it, is, it is not trying to put a price on somebody's life. Um, really what it's trying to do is trying to put a value on um, reductions in the risk of death. Um, and people have tried to estimate it in a number of different ways. Um, the original one, and probably still the most common, is that um, people typically get paid what economists call a compensating differential. That is, they get paid somewhat more for taking on a riskier job, other things equal. That is, you have two people sort of, of similar experience and education abilities. Um, if one is working in a riskier job, then um, they get, uh, they'll typically get paid more. Um, and then using that to say, well, how do people value um, uh, additional risks of death? Um, and it's usually dealing with relatively, um, relatively small additional changes in the probability of, of, of death. Um, it turns out, though, that if you use those, um, you know, so that, for instance, if somebody takes on a job with a, a 1 in 100,000, say it increases the probability of death by 1 in 100,000, um, and they get paid $100 more than somebody with comparable skills and ability, that actually translates to uh, a value of statistical life of around $10 million um, that, that, that people put on um, uh, reducing the risk of, of death. Um, and so it's actually, it turns out to be, it usually comes out to be a relatively large number. People di estimated different ways. Um, the one that the government uses right now is actually about, I think the last time I checked it was about $9.1 million was the value that they were using. Um, and, and this goes back to the question as well, is that this is actually something that's done a lot. Um, it's a sort of talking about COVID and the cost of the economy has brought more attention to it. But in fact, government agencies like the Department of Transportation and the EPA um, you know, use this idea all the time because they're dealing with uh, regulations or investments that are going to affect the probability of people getting, for instance, killed in a car accident or deaths associated with um, uh, increased um, uh, environmental pollution. Um, and, um, you know, they weigh the, what is the cost of those regulations um, against this idea of uh, value of a statistical life. Um, so it's actually something that is done on a, on a regular basis. Um, it's, uh, um, the, the government has actually used it relatively little with, with COVID. Um, a lot of economists have been saying, you know, it's like you should, um, they should probably be, you know, paying more attention to this. I mean, one of the conclusions is that, um, again, that the, uh, um, 
there would be a huge value um, for you know any sort of medical innovations that are going to reduce those those um, um, likely deaths from 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 COVID nineteen. Keith, Thanks let me, let me yeah, just, go ahead. there is a source um, listed on the source page. Um, Dr. Greenlaw gave that to me, thank you. That's talking about valuing life in, in COVID-19 decisions. So, and someone in the chat had asked how to access those. They're all available online if you Google them. Um, but one of the things I would add is that I think um, the idea of placing a value on a human life, and, and Brad's talked about that that's not actually what we're doing, but that is highly distasteful. Um, but the problem is that whether we acknowledge we're doing it or not, we, we always end up doing it. So for example, we know that driving cars leads to car accidents and that leads to deaths. So if we truly value human life infinitely, then we wouldn't drive cars because cars kill people. Right, so when we have this decision about like how high to set the speed limit, we know as the speed limit goes up, the number of deaths goes up. So by will, being willing to accept a speed limit above zero, we're accepting some number of deaths, therefore we're valuing life. So um, I understand the, the questions and the idea of the ethics and the distastefulness of doing that. The problem is if we don't do it, it's still inherent in the decisions we ultimately have to make. Right, right, understood. So, um, you know, one of the things that I, I've talked to folks a lot about, and Margaret, you and I have been in these conversations many times, is, you know, when, you, when you're going through a crisis like, like the one that we've been dealing with, is it, you know, it amplifies certain kinds of problems, it identifies certain kinds of deficiencies in your systems and your organizations in ways that you never thought about before. And the next question that I, I wanted to ask sort of uh, touches on that a little bit. Are, it, let me, let me get the question just right. Are there policies uh, that you think should be enforced or released uh, given current data and information about, about what's happening with COVID-19? Economic policies. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by economic policies. Anything framed around what the topic of the, of the discussion today. Yeah, because I think... Margaret emphasizes at the end that there's a, a lot of economists who would argue that that some system of of testing and tracing people um, would be uh, a more efficient way of uh, um, mitigating the, the the spread of the disease than just sort of blanket shutdowns that affect everywhere. Um, you know, but the you know one of the things is you have to be re you have to be prepared. You have to be at, able to do that. Um, and, uh, um, you know, one of the arguments for the shutdown in the first place was that it bought time um, so that we could uh, come up with a better policy like that. Um, if you're talking about economic, I mean, economic policies for, such as the, the, the stimulus, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's probably going to be a need for, <laughs> a need for more. <laughs> um, of 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 that, um, largely it's a distributional matter. It's not affecting. Normally, economic stimulus is intended to try and stimulate economic demand and get the economy producing more. This is really more about making sure that uh, I think that everybody has enough purchasing power to um, get the necessities. Yeah, Keith, I think that the, um, the idea of, of testing and needing reliable tests, more tests, earlier tests, because the quality of both individual decisions and government decisions relies on the quality of the information. Um, so that being lacking really hindered our ability to have um, the, the best policies. And so still working toward that um, screen test, trace, and quarantine is, is really important. And I think the other th thing that we need to really focus on is, is the inequality, the inequity, the fact that um, different people, different groups, different areas are affected differently. So if we have a policy for, for the average, um, it's not necessarily going to deal with those differential impacts on different groups. And I think some kind of policy to address that and be more targeted um, with both our um, 
intervention in terms of the disease and our economic intervention is, is definitely something we need to, to work toward. Now, the next highest question that was upvoted uh, is a question about unemployment benefits that were approved and supported by the federal government. Uh, and those were in addition to what were standard unemployment benefits. And part of the question has to do with whether or not there were also additional benefits given to essential workers, um, however they were classified. But I think it also, I'd like to connect that to some of the discussion you just had about policymaking, um, and I think referenced in a couple of the last questions about perhaps um, greater salaries or benefits for essential workers. Um, is this something that would be, uh, you, you would include in an economic forecast or recommendation for policymaking about essential workers, either in terms of just their, their standard benefits and, or pay, um, or other ways that the economy can support essential workers, um, given the nature of the pandemic? Um, yeah, we should uh, definitely support uh, essential workers. Um, you know, the value of statistical life, the research that it's based upon would suggest they should probably receive increased pay for increased hazards, um, you know, at, at this time. Um, to the extent, I mean, I don't think that has really been sort of a central part of um, any of the government, any of the federal government programs up to, up to this point. Um, um, if it is, I, I don't know that. Um, you know, I think there's been more of a, uh, a sort of focus on um, ensuring people that have completely lost their income have some, some income. Um, yeah, I think that the macroeconomic policies, like at, at the initial stimulus package, the idea is to get, to get that money out into the economy. Right to try and, and stave off the collapse, prop up the economy, um, and and so in that sense, it doesn't really matter where the money goes or what it's for, is to just get it out there and, and stimulate the economy. But going back to what I said before, um, a more targeted approach in terms of um, who the money goes to, and you know the essential workers are essential and we need them, and so targeting the money. Uh, to provide incentives for people in those positions, targeting the money who have the higher costs and are taking a bigger hit from the effects of the disease um, makes, makes more sense, you get more benefit. So from a macroeconomic perspective, uh, you just wanna look at the total amount of money put out there. But when you think more on a microeconomic level, um, especially given these disparities, then you would wanna focus on um, certain workers and certain parts of the population with that economic stimulus. Good, thank you. All right, yeah, thanks for that. Um, we were short on time here. We only have a couple minutes left. Um, there's another uh, question that's been asked about, um, about how, the, how stimulus is provided. Um, there are models where stimulus goes directly to the consumers versus going to the corporations. And I'm wondering if you could say anything about what you think are the advantages or, or disadvantages of those two sort of approaches to stimulate the economy. Do you want to Margaret or do you want me? Uh, uh, either one of you. Oh. Margaret, you want to go first? <laughs> um, you know, I mean, I was going to say, so it was like actually, um, we, we hadn't really talked about this before, but I mean, most economic recessions, uh, most economists think of them as being caused by um, demand side factors. That is, there's, you know, something that causes a, a, a big decrease in demand. Um, and, you know, that's why people pay so much attention to the Federal Reserve manipulating interest rates. You know, they lower interest rates to try and get people to be more likely to spend money, buy houses, all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, whereas this is kind of unusual in that it really started from a more of a supply side thing. You know, we basically shut down, um, you know, production in uh, some categories of the, the, the economy. Um, but then that secondarily leads to this huge decrease in aggregate demand um, because all those people lost the income that they would have, that they would have had. Um, and so, um, you know, as, as Margaret was pointing out, from from that standpoint, thinking about okay, just trying to stimulate the economy again, um, you know, and it, it, 
there it makes a sense to there it makes sense to get the the money directly to to consumers i think um you know and especially generally lower income uh, people tend to spend all of their income um anyway so if you want to make sure that the money is getting out there and getting spent um, um you know that's um, um one of the things you probably probably want to consider yeah Dr. Ray, any final thoughts? Um, I'm not, not really. We had about a minute left. You caught me off guard there. Um, <laughs> but I think, I think, I hope that um, everyone has seen sort of the, the broad application of economics and, and the, the way that economics can contribute to a lot of different questions and, and is interlinked with a lot of different disciplines. Um, so I'm taking my last couple minutes to make a pitch to those, uh, particularly the incoming students, to, uh, to consider uh, economics as, as uh, something that, that they can study either to go along with what they're studying or as their uh, field of inquiry, because it really does open you up to uh, addressing a, a wide variety of, of questions and topics and issues out there. Absolutely right, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ray, for your uh, engaging presentation. Thank you, Dr. Hansen, for joining us for the Q&A. It's very, very insightful. I think we've learned a lot. Uh, just a, a quick preview here next week, uh, Monday and Wednesday. On Monday, we're going to talk about communication, and our very own Dr. Rao is going to be leading that presentation on how we communicate. Uh, and on Wednesday, I'm very excited to have uh, Dr. Steve Farnsworth and Dr. Rosalind Cooperman, who are going to talk to us a little bit about some of the uh, political issues. And I believe actually on Monday, yeah, Dr. Rao is going to be joined by one of his colleagues, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Johnson Young is going to uh, join him as well. So uh, lots of good stuff in store for next week as well. Um, this, this pandemic is affecting all of us in lots of different ways. We're seeing it in society <laughs> in, in many ways, a lot of very positive things that are coming out of it and a lot of very negative things are coming out of it and we're keeping an eye on it all and seeing how higher ed can respond and educate and help society to get through this. So thank you both very much. Uh, UMW students that are uh, joining the, the uh, small group discussions, remember that you need to log out of the webinar and into your separate Zoom um, link to, to get into those small group discussions. Thank you all so much for joining us. We'll see you next Monday night, four o'clock for our discussion about communication through the pandemic. Bye-bye.